like podcast rocking. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, rocking to be here, and I have a special guest today. I have my mom. So we're gonna talk a little bit about my journey to firing my boss. We're gonna talk about my mom's work experience and her journey. I'm gonna sprinkle in some other fun topics, as only mom and son can do. So welcome, Mom. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I know you know better than anybody <laughs> how I've been pretty ambitious, really just my whole life, and how I've you know been on the I don't know. I've always chased like accolades. I've always Greatness. chased like accomplishments. Yeah. And so making a decision to leave uh, my career of ten years in the banking industry was a huge decision for me to make. And people ask me frequently, what did my parents, my family, my friends think about? And I know that was, that was one of the things that weighed on me the most in making the decision, in that I didn't want to let anybody down. So I just wanted you to share kind of like what your thoughts were. I know we had many conversations leading up to the decision. What were your thoughts when you found out about the decision? What are your thoughts now? I wasn't surprised by your decision. I was, as a parent, as a mom, I'm worried about uh, the well-being of my children. So I was really concerned with how you were going to pay bills, live. So that was really my only concern. But um, you're never going to starve. <laughs> you know, you'll always have a place to stay. So, um, aside from that, I was just like, just, okay, do it. I don't. I mean, you didn't let me down in the in the least. I'm not disappointed by any of the moves that you are making. I'm actually, you know, really quite proud of you. Uh, thank you. Um, I did a good job. I did a good job. I did a good job. You did a good job. I think um, another part of this journey, or rather this experience is part of a longer journey that I've been vocalizing quite a lot in the various media outlets, podcasts, interviews that I've done, whether that's written or oral, around what financial empowerment means to me and what my financial empowerment journey has been both as an active participant in achieving financial empowerment, but also as somebody who is an advocate for financial empowerment for other people. And some of that journey, um, I, I, I talk about the period of time in life where we struggle. I talk about how, um, you know, Section 8 food stamps shaped my money mindset and seeing the sacrifices and the struggles that you had endured during that period of time in life and the mindset shift that occurred from Mount Vernon in 2010 to Texas to Connecticut. Think about to Mount Vernon. Think about the times where I had no knowledge of personal finance. We didn't talk about money in the house. All I knew was what we had and what we were doing and where I am today. You matured into I'm trying to get the words right. You at the time that you I think became hyper aware of uh, what life was like was a really critical period for you. And you were thrust into a role in which you had to be made aware of what was going on at that time. 2008, when I was in the hospital with your brother. I think more than ever, you had a front seat to what it was like to, you know, operate the household because I had to um like literally 
so you can come up to the hospital with the mail so that I can give you the money to to pay the, the bills. I think that's when I, you may have become hyper aware of what how difficult the situation was. Prior to that, I think that I don't know. We, we did not talk about money in the house. Is there a reason for that though? Like why why didn't we do you feel like you was in a position to educate me on like the nuances of money management? Or did you just feel like you had more time? Like is it something like Oh, I don't want to say that. Um, I just wasn't equipped properly okay. um i mean in all honesty i don't think a lot of us black people are equipped we don't have those regular conversations last time you were actively full-time employed <laughs> was 2008 13 years 13 ago 13 years ago yes i have been i'm feral I'm so let's now. so let's talk about your journey because I know some of my fondest memories growing up were seeing you come home in office attire and having you say, Give me ten minutes. <laughs> Give me an hour. I need an hour. I need an hour. You need you need time to decompress, which I didn't understand then, but I completely understand now. <laughs> um but I the last the last job that I remember you having, I remember you were like an office manager. I remember kind of like admiring that you were an authority in, in the workplace. I remember you sharing with me that it was very similar to like having children, like being a parent. And, and then I went into management years and years later and had to learn how to play the corporate game. And now, having separated myself from a corporate environment, I realized that I have a lot of resentment to towards that game because my journey over the last few months have been in discovering who, not only who it is that I am, but who it is that I want to be because corporate America has such an influence on how we show up, what we say, what we wear, what we don't wear, um, what we tolerate, the disrespect, the microaggressions, and so I know that that was once a part of your world, and, and you describe yourself as being feral today. Talk about the change in your mindset, and well, we'll we'll start there. Talk about the change in your mindset from working in a corporate environment to now not, and, and if you want to share what it is that you do now. <laughs> I I have a job. I have a job that I work 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I have no vacations. I have no sick days, and I don't get paid. I don't. I'm, I have a child that is 13 years old who has Down syndrome, and it requires um, that I'm there for him that i am available for him at his beck and call 24 hours a day seven days a week zephyr runs i just work for him but i don't derive a paycheck from that so i also don't have problems with um management because i am management. <laughs> getting dressed in the morning like picking out my outfit for the day, that's something that I look, I miss, I miss that. I, even though I don't like mornings at all, like being up early in the morning, there is a certain um, solitude when you're up really, really early <laughs> that I miss. It, it's just, it was just, the, I guess, the routine of you know, getting dressed to go to work. I do not miss the commute. I 
do not miss the politics. What's your advice for navigating those politics? The microaggressions? I told you, I am feral now. I don't... I, I look back at a lot of the things that I that I dealt with and oh, like if somebody if I were to re-enter the workforce <clears throat> and um I had to deal with the things that I dealt with when I was younger and naive. Oh, that thing was lost. It wasn't that I never enjoyed my job, like the things that I was hired to, you know, to do. It was really just politics of, of different places sometimes you know you would be in a work environment that was harmonious you know um because i have a lot of anxiety when um i go into a, a office that is um there's like a lot of discord there, there's a lot of cattiness and, and cliches. It's just like, that was a, a really eye-opening experience for me in young adultery and entering into corporate because you would think that um, people would mature past the personalities that they had when they were in high school and middle school, you know, that whole mean girl click thing or um it was still clicky so i didn't i don't i mean like places like that also because i didn't um think i know think i know white people in corporate have a problem when you just want to be left alone in your own time, like your lunch is your fucking lunch. Oh my god, I have stories for days. Alone, <laughs> like, why do you get so personally offended? Because I don't want to eat lunch with you. It's my lunch. Or I don't want to talk to you about. I don't want to talk. Yeah, I, or you. I just. I don't want to know what. Billy did. Did I ask? <laughs> like you forcing? You probably not know that sounds mean. People always it doesn't think, sound mean. People, I think people, people will relate think to that it. That I'm mean because, like, it's like I like you, okay? I remember Karen, when I was working. I like you, but my last job when we were still in the office, when it was lunchtime for me, I would get up and leave the building and go sit in my car. <laughs> I would go sit in my car because I did not want people to talk to me. And it wasn't that I don't want to talk to people. I just didn't want to talk to people on my time. It, yes, it's your time. I need. I, first of all, I need that. That especially in a, like I said, in a place where it's just stressful. The energy is stressful, and people are petty, and there's all kind of inner office drama. I just need. In, in those eight hours that I'm there, I, I need a break. So let me, um, let me have my space. Don't come in my, don't come in my space. That's my time. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to do anything work related during my, any of my breaks or Especially during paid break. my, or an unpaid break, I'm sorry. Especially an unpaid break. Yeah. Like, don't ask me to do any... I'm... This is my time. And I don't understand why you're so offended at how I want to spend my break. It's a break. Let me have it. Away, away from you. I don't want to... Yeah. What wakes you up in the morning? What keeps you going? 
What is your passion realized? You know that I am still trying to find out what I want to be when I grow up. Well, that, I mean, <laughs> I think that's important to share, though. That I don't know what I want to be when I grow up? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the millennials from my age in particular, from early 30s, even before 30s, late 20s, feel like they have to have it all together or they have to have accomplished you do not, this massive You do not. You do not. Thing. <laughs> Let me tell you, 50 has, turning 50 has um, <laughs> shifted some uh, priorities look should be and look like in life and i always i try to tell y'all <laughs> because of my lived experience where i am now versus what i have lived when i was younger like i try to give y'all warnings about stuff but one of my favorite things that you that you have shared with me over over the years of my life is that you've been a mom longer than you've been anything, anything else, else. I imagine that there's a level of personal fulfillment that you have in seeing like your creation, like your children thrive and accomplish and do things, especially based off the sacrifices that you made. So like, is there a lesson, a life lesson that you learned in transitioning from a corporate driven environment to a maybe a purpose or passion driven environment. You know what? I don't like podcast rocking. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Podcast rocking because you, it's, we don't we are not having a conversation like we talk. I feel like oh, I'm being damn it interviewed. You are being interviewed though. <laughs>